Hello, and welcome to DM1, Disease Development, Symptoms, and Management. This session is part of the DM1 track. It is intended for individuals living with DM1 and their families. The session is being recorded and will be available for viewing after the conference on the MDF Digital Academy at www.myatonic.org slash digital dash academy. I am Mike Knoppen, the MDF Program Director, and I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jacinda Sampson. I've seen her presentation slides and I know we are in for a treat. To ask questions of Dr. Sampson or to make a comment, please use the chat. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the program. However, Dr. Sampson will address those questions at the end of the presentation. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sampson, who is a clinical associate professor at Stanford University Hospitals and Clinics. She is a neuromuscular and neurogenetics specialist who has been caring for patients and families with myotonic dystrophy and other familial neurological disorders for over 12 years. She is actively involved in observational and clinical research in myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular and neurogenic disorders. And now it is my great privilege to invite Dr. Sampson to present to us today. Okay. Hello, um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to talk again at the MDF con conference and I'm going to try to cover as best I can this extremely broad uh, disorder and uh, describe kind of my understanding of how it all fits together. Trying to get my slides to go, there we go. So myotonic dystrophy is distinct from other muscular dystrophies um, and it's all part of the name. So myotonic, uh, the myotonia is one of the chief characteristics of myotonic dystrophy, but clearly not its only feature. And myotonia refers to the inability of the muscles to relax after contracting. And in the um, early uh, iconography of our foundation, um, this is uh, demonstrated by the uh, difficulty in relaxing after grip. Um, that was one of the key diagnostic features neurologists would use. But under the microscope, we see more. Uh, we see the dystrophic aspect of the disease, which dystrophy means that there is degeneration of the muscle fibers over time, which shows that this is a progressive disorder and this can cause progressive muscle weakness. And this has been recognized for a long time. Um, there are more than one types of, of myotonic disorder and myotonic dystrophy type one has been published under a variety of names which can make it difficult to hunt down information in the literature. So myotonic dystrophy type 1 is also dystrophia myotonica type 1. And you need to remember that there is also a congenital form in myotonic dystrophy type 1 called congenital myotonic dystrophy. There is another myotonic dystrophy type 2 uh, that's a different gene, different repeat expansion, and its symptoms overlap a lot with myotonic dystrophy type one, and it has other names in the literature, um, uh, specifically proximal myotonic myopathy. And it does not have a clear infant onset form. But I also want you to remember if you're just Googling DM1, DM1 isn't just an abbreviation for myotonic dystrophy type one, that's the same abbreviation doctors use for diabetes mellitus type one. So that can be quite confusing. Some people use the abbreviation MD1, um, but it hasn't been universally adopted. There are also non-dystrophic myotonias um, that also go by the name myotonia congenita not to be confused with congenital myotonic dystrophy. These are different separate genetic disorders uh, and are also called Becker myotonia and Thompson myotonia. And these are caused by mutation uh, in uh, channels that are expressed on muscles. So who discovered this? Um, Hans Steiner first described it in 1909 
but it took years before it was recognized that there was an uh, infantile onset or a congenital form. Um, the prevalence is probably much higher than the originally reported 13 per 100,000. And Nick Johnson has been doing some really important work in this in order to show that a lot of myotonic dystrophy goes unidentified uh, and that the incidence is probably much higher than we thought. Um, the, it is not a sex-linked disorder. It is just as frequent in men as in women. And it's called a polynucleotide repeat disorder. So what, what does that refer to? So the poly means many, and uh, the number of nucleotides is specified in the name. So uh, tri, which the uh, myotonic dystrophy type one is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. So three base pairs in these repeats that get repeated over and over in the expanded repeat in uh, the uh, DNA. Um, Myotonic type two is actually a tetranucleotide repeat disorder and the other repeat disorders with different lengths. These repeats can either be in the region of the DNA that doesn't spell for the amino acids that make up the protein. And those are called non-coding. And then there are some repeat disorders where the uh, repeat expansions are in the protein and they do change the amino acids, but myotonic dystrophy is not one of those. It is a non-coding repeat disorder. So the question might be, um, how do these things relate to each other? Well, we think that there are commonalities between these polynucleotide repeat diseases and uh, myotonic dystrophies aren't the only ones. Um, there are many different types with different symptoms. Nearly all of them have some neurological aspect to them and they include spinocerebellar ataxia, Friedrich's ataxia, Huntington's disease, certain familial types of Lou Gehrig's disease, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. You can see there's quite a list. Um, but we do learn a lot about myotonic dystrophy type one from these other disorders. And I would suggest if you're interested in this topic, to tune in for the research update on DM2 and RAN proteins, because uh, um, Laura Ranum and her group has done a lot of important work in looking at polynucleotide repeat diseases. So in DM1, just to focus on DM1, which is what we were wanting to talk about today, what is the genetic mutation? It is a non-coding trinucleotide repeat, CTG, that occurs over and over again in the non-coding region of a gene called dystrophica myotonia protein kinase gene. Too long to keep saying, so we're gonna call it DMPK. These repeats occur in everybody. It's just how many is what is related to the disease. So people who don't have and won't get myotonic dystrophy have between five and 37 repeats. There's what we call a pre-mutation range of 38 to 49 repeats where that person themselves might not have symptoms, but their children or generations to come, the repeats might expand and start to cause symptoms. We generally consider a mild range to be between five and 50, classic quote unquote between 100 and 1000, and then congenital between 730 to up to 5000. But it's not a perfectly predictive thing, this number. And I'll go over that more in a minute. So just to review, there's more than one myotonic dystrophy. They are both caused by polynucleotide repeat expansions. There are myotonias that are not dystrophic and they're caused by mutations in ion channels, specifically chloride and sodium. Myotonic type one is caused by CTG repeats in DMPK. And myotonic type two is caused by repeats in a zinc finger nine protein. So I have difficult, I struggle a lot with the term mild myotonic dystrophy. Um, it's used to describe the severity of symptoms. And sometimes people use it to describe myotonic type one with fewer repeat size and later onset. But some doctors also use it to describe myotonic dystrophy type two, which is genetically different. Either way, if you're the person who has myotonic dystrophy, compared to people who don't have myotonic dystrophy, it might not feel mild to you. So I don't want to minimize anyone's experience of myotonic dystrophy. 
So how do we test for this? Because it's a repeat expansion, it can be really difficult to identify. Some of the most common and inexpensive muscular dystrophy panels for genetic testing don't include myotonic dystrophy type one or type two on that test, even though myotonic dystrophy is really, really common. Well, why is that? It's because that common inexpensive way of sequencing DNA in small chunks doesn't pick up the repeat expansions. So how do we do this? Um, well, classically, we would run it on a gel and just see how big that expansion is. Uh, and this is an example of that. So uh, basically you, you take DNA, you cut it up into chunks, you put it on a gel that separates it by size. So uh, bigger uh, uh, DNA uh, lengths don't run as fast. Smaller ones are able to run faster and they run down the gel here. But uh, the higher ones indicate that there is an expansion of the repeats. But one of the things you notice, it's not just one spot, one location that gives us one particular size. It's a smear of all different repeat expansions and lengths. And so if you look at this kind of like a landscape, you can see that there might be, you know, some that run very fast in the normal range and then some that are slower and then a whole lot in one particular region and then some really big pieces of DNA that don't run fast at all. So how do we choose a number? Do we choose the tallest peak? Do we choose the slowest fragment? It, it makes it difficult and complex. And you can imagine that this can be different uh, depending on how the lab does it. So you might test your DM1 repeat expansion in one lab and get one number and another lab and get another number. It doesn't mean that one lab or the other is wrong. It just means that it is a complex thing to test for. Many people ask me, can myotonic dystrophy type two turn into type one? No, it can't. It's a totally different gene and expansion and it's in a completely different place. So myotonic dystrophy type one, if you look at all your chromosomes, you've all heard of 23 and me, you've got 23, 22 chromosomes and sex chromosomes that um, uh, determine uh, uh, genetic gender. Um, and then you have uh, myotonic dystrophy type 1 is not on the sex chromosome. So like I said, doesn't affect both men and women. Uh, and uh, the DM1 is on chromosome 19. Myotonic dystrophy type 2 is on chromosome 3. So different genes, different locations. Can't turn one into the other. A lot of people ask, where did myotonic dystrophy come from? Uh, many people notice at our meetings, uh, and in publications that there seems to be um, a lot of racial disparity in uh, the myotonic dystrophy population. And this is partly because of that repeat expansion phenomenon that in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, that, that pre-mutation repeat didn't occur until uh, humans started to migrate out of Africa uh, into Europe and Southeast Asia and uh, across the countries, um, across the continents. So uh, right about when they were migrating out of Africa is when the myotonic dystrophy type one repeat expansion evolved. And then the myotonic dystrophy type two expansion evolved much later uh, after individuals had reached uh, Western Europe. And we do know that there was a separate, separate separate evolutionary event where myotonic dystrophy type two also arose in Japan. Um, so there is some geographic differences in frequencies of the myotonic dystrophies. So how is it inherited? I keep say, saying it uh, is men and women are equal chance of inheriting it. So it's what we call a dominantly inherited disorder. You only need one abnormal copy of the DMPK expansion gene in order to have myotonic dystrophy. And that could come either from your mom's side of the family or your dad's side of the family. This is why we take family trees and ask that question a lot. If you have myotonic dystrophy, your kids each have a 50% chance of inheriting the gene. And that's a 50% chance with each pregnancy. It doesn't have to even out. It's like tossing a, toy, uh, tossing a coin. It could come up heads several times in a row. 
Oops. But it isn't always the same between generations. One of the odd things about the myotonic dystrophies, as well as other repeat expansion disorders, is that they can have this phenomenon called anticipation. Anticipation I used to think of as um, you know, looking forward to something like opening presents on your birthday. But in genetics, anticipation means that symptoms occur earlier with successive generations and sometimes with more severe phenotype, more severe symptoms. And this is illustrated in um, Dr. Harper's classic photo of a family where the grandmother doesn't seem to show many of the facial characteristics of myotonic dystrophy, um, but the daughter does and the grandchild has a, a more severe phenotype, a congenital onset with more weakness of his head, as you can see, can't hold his head up well, and weakness of the facial muscles. And this is illustrated here that it can change over the generations. So one individual may only have 68 repeats on their testing, their daughter might have 84, their son might have 78, but then in the next generation and it can expand more and this can occur when it's inherited from the paternal line as well as the maternal line. But the repeat expansions tend to get larger faster from the maternal line, but it can get larger from either parent. And so that is where we get this categorization of um, uh, later onset symptoms to earlier onset symptoms. And so the repeat size can vary over the generation. So how does that happen? Well, um, we don't entirely understand, but in sperm, the repeat expansions um, are unstable uh, from the paternal size, and there's normal variation in all the sperm, um, but it can't expand to be as large an expansion as when it's inherited from the maternal side. And uh, you tend to see uh, that the repeat size can vary between tissues. Uh, once the eggs and sperm meet and you're starting to develop an embryo, different tissues can have different repeat sizes. Different repeat sizes can change over the course of development as you go from egg to embryo to infant. And uh, this is something that you see in uh, both adults and children. And this change uh, in repeat number between tissues continues in adulthood. Uh, and this is called somatic mosaicism. And I tried to illustrate this here like a mosaic to show the different sizes that you can see of the repeats and that it could be different in different tissues. So your um, proximal muscles might have a lower number than your distal muscles and your brain might have a different number and your heart might have a different number. And so some of this helps explain why different people have such different symptoms and why it affects different tissues so much. So what is the mechanism of this disease? Um, one of the hypotheses is that this is a toxic RNA disorder, or another word for that is a spliceopathy. So to go back to um, how DNA, RNA, and protein interrelate, um, your DNA is the, the way I think of it is the library for all the genes that make up you. Um, there's a lot of DNA in between the genes and it's wrapped up into chromosomes and kept in your nucleus. But you need to get that information out in order to make proteins to build your body. And the messenger RNA is the recipe for that. It's kind of like a post-it note for how do I make the protein? and that's called the messenger RNA. And that gets transcribed from the protein and then it gets exported. But first it needs to be processed before you can translate it into a protein. And that's called RNA splicing. So interestingly enough, the recipe needs to have things cut and paste before it's in a form that you can turn, that you can use to make your protein. And so, uh, in order to do this cutting and pasting, you have what are called exons, those code for the amino acids that make up the protein. Then you have introns that don't. They're the bits that get cut out. One interesting thing is that your genes can have multiple forms of a protein coded by the same gene. So depending on what tissues it in, 
it's in, it might express a different form of the protein. So one protein, one tissue might need this exon and another uh, tissue might need that exon. And so you need to splice it differently depending on what you're gonna use it for. So it's a bit multi-purpose. I kind of think of this as having a basic recipe like making cookies and you can either add chocolate chips or you can add oatmeal and raisins but you don't wanna have both chocolate chips and oatmeal raisins in the same cookie. Um, and different tissues are gonna order their specific desired cookie recipe. So that's my cookie analogy. Um, and so the cooks in the kitchen are basically this committee of proteins called the spliceosome. And their job is to do the cutting and pasting of that RNA message. One of those components of this spliceosome, this committee of proteins is called MBNL1, muscle blind one. You'll hear about that a lot in some of the scientific talks. It gets bound up by these polynucleotide repeats, the CTG repeats. It gets stuck there and doesn't um, perform its normal function on all of these different recipes, different RNAs. So it's not just one RNA that gets abnormally spliced. It's all different kinds. So it's not just an assembly line for cookies. It's an assembly line for all different recipes that aren't getting put together right because the committee members are not in the right place. And so what does this look like? So if muscle blind is getting stuck to the repeats in the nucleus, this is literally what it looks like. In your, uh, in culture, in a dish, you can grow myotonic dystrophy neurons and normal neurons, and you can uh, use uh, an, uh, a, a probe to light up the RNA uh, with the CUG repeats, which is what it looks like in the RNA form. Uh, and then the muscle blind uh, as well. And you can see there are these like little granules um, of RNAs that are all stuck in the nucleus. They're not going anywhere. Instead of what it should look like, which is all of this information getting exported and turned into protein and then going on to form its normal functions. So this is why we think myotonic dystrophy is multisystemic is that you're getting splicing abnormalities in lots of different genes that are important in lots of different tissues. So splicing abnormalities have been detected in muscle, in brain, in the eyes, in the heart, and in the lungs. But we also know that it affects a lot of other systems in our body that are still being studied to understand better how these splicing changes and other changes affect myotonic dystrophy individuals. So it affects your gastrointestinal tract, your skin and your hair, your hormonal balances. It can affect pregnancy and it can lead to complications in anesthesia and surgery. So how does it do this? Well, in myotonic dystrophy type one, it's more the distal muscles, distal muscles meaning the muscles in your hands, more so than the muscles in your shoulders or your hips, which is not to say that you might not have weakness there. It's just proportionally, there's more weakness in the hands and the ankles than in the shoulders and the hips. And Dr. Uh, Eric Wang, uh, one of the leaders in the field studying these uh, transcriptional changes shows that the proximal muscles, if we look at the change in splicing compared to the quadricep, which is one of the big thigh muscles, that you can see differences in different muscles. So the deltoids do not have as much difference as the calf muscle or the muscles uh, that power breathing, uh, but you see the most changes in the muscles of the tibialis. This is a shin, the muscle on the front of your shin or the soleus muscle, which is on the back of your calf. Um, so you can see in multiple subjects, this trend remains true, but varies in severity between different people. So different people have different degrees of splicing changes. Um, we know it affects the eyes. Again, we know splicing is involved. Uh, many of the genes in the interferon pathways are affected. We, we know the beta crystalline, which forms the clearness of your, of your uh, eye lens uh, can be affected. And it causes these cataracts that um, historically have been called Christmas tree cataracts. And it's, it's not, actually because they look like a Christmas tree. It's more because 
I think they look like tinsel. Um, they have this, this really uh, colorful uh, refractive look to them uh, like it glitters. But you really only see this with a slit lamp exam with an ophthalmologist. The, the um, uh, ophthalmoscope that we use in clinic just doesn't show the, the colorful uh, rainbow effect. But it also affects the brain. Um, it affects splicing in a number of different uh, genes and proteins in the brain, including tau. Um, and we see that there are changes on imaging, just on regular imaging in children with the congenital form. Uh, there can be white matter changes that are around the ventricle. So this is, this is a picture of, of a child's brain. Uh, and it, it, it's a little bit uh, confusing. Your spinal fluid looks white, your white matter looks dark gray, and your gray matter looks light gray but there shouldn't be white matter changes right here next to this uh, spinal fluid ventricles here. Uh, in adults, it can be a little further out uh, in the white matter, and it can be mistaken for stroke. It can be mistaken for multiple sclerosis, um, but it, these are, are changes in myelination that occur in uh, myotonic dystrophy, and there are studies going on in several centers now to try to understand this better. How does it affect the connectivity of these neurons in the brain. We know cognitively there can be effects on the brain. Uh, and um, this can uh, lead to some difficulties, particularly in uh, frontal lobe function and executive uh, function, which is um, organizational, prioritizing things, multitasking. Um, uh, so it can, it can lead to difficulties with attention. And uh, in children, um, learning disabilities can be very common. So working with your school system to get an IEP uh, can be really important. Um, there's going to be some additional talks about this on Friday or today, later today, about these mechanistic aspects, if you want to tune into that. The heart is a muscle and it is affected by myotonic dystrophy. Um, again, Dr. Wang's uh, work shows that um, there are changes in splicing of a vast number of genes involved in the heart, um, comparing the healthy heart to myotonic dystrophy. Um, you can see that there are changes in expression. This is called a heat map. And so the color uh, intensity reflects the uh, degree of differences in uh, splicing changes. But the way that it affects the heart, it can affect the heart rhythm. Uh, in causing slow heart rhythm or blocks in signaling from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart can cause atrial flutter or fibrillation. And that can be a stroke risk. Uh, and there's a risk of sudden cardiac death. It can also affect the heart muscle itself and cause weakness of the heart muscle. Uh, and there will be more information on this as well today uh, in, that, uh, in the uh, research uh, path uh, of the meeting, but there's also several um, really excellent talks in the Digital Academy on the MDF website. Um, so this is why in our care consideration guidelines, we encourage people to get their heart checked regularly, have a cardiologist, have a baseline echo, EKG, have those things rechecked frequently because uh, some of these uh, impacts on the heart can be prevented through preventive medical care. Um, I think how it affects the gastrointestinal tract is not as well understood as how it affects other systems. We think that it involves the smooth muscle, but probably also the nerves that signal the gastrointestinal tract. There's some really good talks about how it affects swallowing uh, on the uh, Digital Academy, as well as the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, but this can really impact your daily life. Um, Swallowing difficulties where you're having coughing or choking when you're eating can lead to aspiration pneumonia, and that can be life-threatening. But in your lower GI tract, abdominal pain is very common. Constipation or um, alternating constipation and diarrhea that gets uh, described as irritable bowel syndrome um, can all be symptoms of myotonic dystrophy itself. Uh, and there are some treatments that can help with the symptoms overall. And, and I will leave that to the ask an expert uh, discussion because it is very individualized. 
um, I did want to talk about how it affects the lungs. So interestingly, in myotonic dystrophy, it doesn't affect the lung tissue itself. It affects the muscles that control the lungs, as well as how your brain controls your breathing rate. So the muscles of breathing are your diaphragm, which is that muscle that goes between your chest and your abdomen. But it also affects the intercostal muscles, which are the muscles that are literally between each of your ribs. And they're both important in your breathing. And how you breathe when you're asleep is controlled by your brain. And uh, people who have myotonic dystrophy more commonly have sleep apnea. They also have a greater risk of aspiration pneumonia because of swallowing difficulties. And but those are both things that are important things to monitor for in myotonic dystrophy. So the ways that we monitor for that is frequently in clinic checking your lung capacity, which is called spirometry. Uh, how much air can you breathe out in a single breath, as well as how strongly can you breathe in and breathe out. Um, many individuals need what's called non-invasive ventilation. Other names for this are CPAP continuous positive airway pressure, BiPAP, bi-level positive airway pressure to help support breathing at night and during sleep. But some people also need it during the day. We highly encourage vaccination uh, because uh, lung infections impact myotonic dystrophy patients more than the general population. You have a higher risk of needing to go to the hospital, higher risk of pneumonia, higher risk of an ICU stay. And one of the easiest things that you can do to help your health if you smoke is to quit. And the benefits for this can be um, fairly rapid in um, helping with uh, phlegm clearance, but also long-term in reducing the risk of other lung complications. And in this current day and age with the COVID-19 pandemic, I strongly encourage vaccination. Many of my patients have been vaccinated. Um, yes, you can have uh, symptoms, flu-like symptoms after a vaccination, but not really different from having an influenza vaccine every year, which we also strongly encourage. But if you do catch COVID, please, please keep in touch with your doctor. If you are short of breath, go to the hospital because you're at higher risk for having pulmonary complications than the general public. And there are guidelines for the emergency room and pulmonologists. If they are not familiar with myotonic dystrophy, on the Myotonic Dystrophy website. So this was put out um, early in the pandemic and is a really useful tool for your care team. All right, so because my Myotonic Dystrophy is so multi-systemic, it doesn't skip over the hormones. It can affect both men and women hormonally. For women, um, they can have irregular or absent menstrual periods. Ovulation can be irregular. Just because your periods are irregular doesn't mean you might not be able to get pregnant. Um, it does affect fertility, but that is not sufficient to rely on for birth control. Um, for men, um, there can be testicular atrophy and low testosterone levels, which can contribute to fatigue. Um, we know that there are differences in growth hormone and how it's secreted over the daily internal clock. Um, and a hormone not many people hear about called the parathyroid hormone, uh, which is, sits right next to your thyroid. Um, its job is to control calcium. That can be out of balance. And if it's uh, affecting your calcium levels, it could affect your bone density as well as uh, muscle strength. Your thyroid can be out of balance as well. But one of the most common things that we see is type two diabetes. And this is directly related to the spliceopathy phenomenon. We know that insulin receptor is abnormally spliced in myotonic dystrophy, but that doesn't mean it can't be treated. The same things that we do for general myotonic, for general type two diabetes, diet, exercise, oral medications, sometimes metformin, sometimes glipizide or glyburide, and if it's needed, insulin can really make a huge difference in someone's health. And we know People with myotonic dystrophy tend to have low bone density, so get your vitamin D levels checked regularly. All right, so sleep, sleepiness and fatigue is a common complaint and problem in myotonic dystrophy. It ranks as one of the highest, um, most bothersome symptoms in many of the surveys. Um, uh, individuals 
say it's not that I'm not getting enough sleep. I sleep a lot, but I still feel sleepy during the day. Um, individuals can have sleep apnea and snoring. Um, sometimes it's not very loud snoring because to snore loudly, you need to be moving a lot of air. And if you're having hypoventilation at night because your lung muscles are weak, you might not be a loud snorer. But also there's weakness of the muscles in the throat and in the tongue. And those tend to relax when you're asleep and they can obstruct your airway and cause sleep apnea. But this is a treatable thing. Um, you can use non-invasive ventilation to help with your nighttime breathing, breathing and hopefully help some with your fatigue. But fatigue as well is multifactorial. There are so many things that can contribute to fatigue that really deserves its own talk. Um, there's some really excellent um, uh, uh, Digital Academy uh, talks about sleep. All right, a little bit about um, anesthesia. This is again something that is a preventable uh, event, or you know, can be uh, uh, prepared for. So uh, we always warn about anesthesia effects of myotonic dystrophy. This doesn't mean that if you need a surgery that you shouldn't get it. Um, you you can. You just need to have your team be prepared. Your surgeon needs to know, your anesthesiologist needs to know, um, and those guidelines are published on the myotonic dystrophy website. Why are we making such a big deal about anesthesia? Because there's an increased complication rate, and the complications are usually related to breathing. Um, you may not wake up as fast from the anesthesia. You may not be breathing or coughing as strongly after anesthesia and that puts you at risk for getting pneumonia after uh, being intubated. Some people have other more, you know, other serious problems, particularly uh, certain types of surgery, uh, such as GI surgery have a higher complication rate. But if your team is prepared um, and you need a surgery, it can uh, be done with precautions and to allow for longer observation and a longer recovery period and just to be watched closer. Um, so things to watch out for are weakness of breathing and coughing and swallowing, not being your normal self when you wake up, being confused, being delirious, um, constipation from pain medications, really common. And I don't know if you know, if you can't go to the bathroom, you can't go home from the hospital. It is kind of a requirement that all systems are operating before you go home. And uh, in rare instances in surgery, especially if you're cold and certain anesthetics, can give you a whole body myotonia, which is, uh, can be a bit of a surprise to the anesthesiologists and surgeons if they don't know that you're at risk for this. So sometimes we see anesthesia complications as the first thing that leads to a diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy. Sometimes people don't know they have myotonic dystrophy until they've had a surgery and had problems after their surgery. Please, everybody put myotonic dystrophy on your smartphone under your health um, uh, uh, app. And uh, we strongly suggest wearing um, uh, a medical alert bracelet. So if you're ever in an accident and end up in an emergency room that isn't your home hospital, people will know that you have myotonic dystrophy and what to watch for. Just makes your their care better and your, you experiencing fewer complications. Other things that can get complicated are pregnancy. And some of this is related to the fetus, maybe having myotonic dystrophy. So if the baby has myotonic dystrophy, also the congenital form, and they aren't swallowing and uh, the amniotic fluid, which is what babies do, um, you can develop what's called polyhydramnios, which is too much amniotic fluid. And that can be a sign that the fetus has myotonic dystrophy. Um, but we also know if mom has myotonic dystrophy, that there's an increased risk of complications. Um, some of these are things like preeclampsia, which is um, uncontrolled hypertension during pregnancy. Labor can be difficult because the uterus is a muscle too. And uh, there can be premature labor or really long labor or failure, what we call failure to progress. There can be problems with the placenta. There can be problems with excessive bleeding after um, delivery, and there's an increased incidence of cesarean sections because the baby might have distress. Uh, and if you have a cesarean section, you might have an increased risk of having 
anesthetic complications related to that. But this just means that if you're pregnant with myotonic dystrophy type 1, you need to have uh, an OBGYN who's familiar with myotonic dystrophy and probably see a specialist in maternal fetal medicine for high risk and uh, be deliver at a hospital that has uh, familiarity with myotonic dystrophy uh, and has uh, you know, everything prepared in advance. So again, a lot of complications can be prevented by uh, uh, prior preparation. So, um, so myotonic dystrophy can affect children too, as you saw in those previous slides, the higher repeat numbers tend to manifest earlier with the phenomenon of anticipation. And this is a, a whole area of study in itself. So the myotonic dystrophy may present at birth, which is the congenital form, with difficulty breathing on their own, difficulty swallowing, um, breastfeeding, or failure to thrive. They might need a feeding tube. GI motility problems are very common in infants, but it may be a little bit later that it's identified. It might be in childhood. Uh, and the central nervous system can often be that first sign or signal with um, delayed milestones, um, could be verbal, could be motor, and learning disabilities can be very common. And this is why getting your educational system involved with an IEP plan or an evaluation can be really important. There is a lot of research going on in this field, both natural history, several groups studying the central nervous system involvement. There is a clinical trial ongoing right now, which I think is going to go be discussed in one of the industry updates either today or tomorrow. And then there's some really good um, a whole section of the MDF website is devoted to myotonic dystrophy in children. All right. I'm often asked about pain in myotonic dystrophy. Why is there pain in myotonic dystrophy and why is it so common? This is a really good question and we do not fully understand it, um, both genetically and physiologically. Um, we know that 50 to 80% of patients will report pain of some type. Low back pain is the most common, but abdominal pain is also really common. Um, we know that there are certain pain medications that can actually cause more problems in myotonic dystrophy, opiates being one of them, that individuals tend to have more common side effects. Um, it can depress your breathing drive, especially during sleep, leading to worsening sleep apnea and sometimes even a respiratory crisis if opiates are new to an individual and the dose is at a regular dose and not a very small dose. Um, it often can slow down and even stop your, your gut motility. So constipation really can be a complication. And it can make people very sleepy, slow down your, your thinking, even make people delirious. Uh, delirium is where you are confused about what's going on around you. You might even see or hear things that aren't there, get really agitated or you know, upset and, and you know, not have your normal cognitive processes working. Um, a lot of people ask me about cannabinoids and myotonic dystrophy. Maybe it's because I live in California now, um, but we really don't have any good clinical trials on this. Um, there was one very small study done in Germany. It wasn't placebo controlled or double blinded, and there were only two people in it who had myotonic dystrophy type one. Um, and it reported that there were some effects, but also that there could be some side effects. And I do wanna mention that they used an oral formulation, not smoking, Smoking anything of any type is bad for your lungs, period, just so you know. Um, but there were also side effects. Some people had more um, constipation. So this is something that really needs to be studied more. And it is legal in, in more and more states. And my recommendation is if you're going to use it, let your doctors know and use a start low, go slow approach uh, because there might be an increased side effect in different people. Um, all right, um, another thing I get asked about is about exercise. Many people um, have been told that exercise is bad if you have muscular dystrophy of any kind, and we're finding that that's actually not true. There's a really excellent study called the Optimistic Study out of the UK uh, and EU. Uh, and uh, they did a randomized trial uh, where um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, in 
um, overcoming uh, impediments to exercise uh, was done. And there was a physical therapist involved to develop an exercise plan. And what they saw is that physical activity helped actually increase muscle mass by 4.2%, depending on where you were looking on this MRI scan. So this was very encouraging. Um, there was also other beneficial outcomes uh, in that study. So we know exercise is good. Um, we usually recommend you to see a physical therapist to see where you should start from, what your, your baseline is, and kind of develop a start low, go slow approach. Of course, you should get your cardiologist to say, yes, it's okay to get uh, to do exercise um, and to screen for uh, any cardiac involvement before you start an exercise plan. So myotonic dystrophy type 1 is a really complex disorder, and uh, it can be a struggle to keep up on all of this exciting new work that's going on in the field. Um, but you're in the right place for that. Um, you can learn about it, and uh, the MDF meetings are a great way to do that. Their website is a great way to burrow into certain things that you want to learn more about. Another thing that you can do is help us educate your medical team. Get yourself a medical care team for all of the different areas that are involved in your myotonic dystrophy. If they don't know about myotonic dystrophy and are willing to learn great resources on the MDF website, usually your myotonic dystrophy neurologist is happy to talk to people about how different systems are involved and what to watch for. There's some really great care consideration guidelines on the website that really outline what you should do on an annual basis to take care of yourself and to help your care team take care of you. So pass those guidelines out to everyone on your team and support each other. I can't tell you, I have learned more about myotonic dystrophy from families and individuals with myotonic dystrophy than I have from any book. And what you tell us leads us to know what's important to do research on. So talk with us, talk with each other, get involved with registries, help us understand how it's affecting you. Um, and uh, all of these things can help us um, uh, lead to better treatments and care. Um, so here are some resources uh, that Mike uh, has uh, put together on our website. Um, there's the body systems tools, so you can click on all these different areas to learn more. The Ask an Expert series is really good if you want to dig deeper in any particular system. The toolkits are where you should point your uh, um, uh, care team, uh, GI, pulmonary, cardiology, et cetera. But you, you know, they're also for you. Um, so you can advocate for yourself in your own care. Um, but it also has a lot of practical information about things like applying for disability, working with the school system, uh, working with physical therapy, occupational therapy. It's a really great resource. And if there's something that I can't answer in the next half hour, um, I highly recommend tuning in tomorrow uh, to uh, talk with Dr. Day, uh, who's one of the leaders in the field of myotonic dystrophy, and see if you can stump the expert uh, to help ask your questions. So I think that is uh, all of my slides. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll take some questions now. Mike is going to um, summarize them for me and I will do my best to answer the questions. Dr. Sampson, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, there has been a very active chat going on with many, many questions for you. I'm doing my best audience to group some of these questions. So. Uh, if you feel your question's not being addressed, uh, feel free to repost the question. And also, as Dr. Sampson said, we do have um, time with Dr. Day tomorrow for a Stump the Expert session. So um, here we go. Uh, a first sort of category of question we got was to ask you to expand a little bit more on the repeat number topic. There's still some questions about what does that number tell us? What does it tell us about ourself? What does it tell us about children we may have? Um, does it tell us anything about severity of symptoms or onset? Can you it, just expand a little more on the repeat number? Sure. Um, so uh, um, I would uh, 
refer you to um, Dr. Monkton, Monkton's two um, talks about uh, repeat expansions and anticipation, which are really excellent. I think, you know, historically, we relied a lot on that number um, to give us a general overview of myotonic dystrophy and its severity. We know that there are general correlations between repeat number and severity, but it is a very poor predictor of when your symptoms will start, how severe they will be, how fast will they progress. Um, and part of this is because of this phenomenon called somatic mosaicism, which means that when you get your blood test drawn, it will have a repeat number. And I described how hard it is to identify that repeat number. Um, is that that number might be different if you check it in two different labs on two different days. And if you checked it in yourself 20 years from now, it might be a little different. We don't know what to do with that number. But we do know that if we sampled all the different tissues in your body, which we don't do clinically because you're still using all those tissues. Um, if we sampled your brain and your heart and your liver and your muscle, they would all have very different repeat numbers. So we think the repeat number locally has a lot to do with the splice severity, but it may not always be the number that's from your blood that we got from your DNA test. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had like an equation, we could say repeat number is this and plug that in and this is what to expect, but it just isn't predictive to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Sampson. Um, we also had a number of questions about sort of family planning topics. There was a question about whether uh, an adult who has myotonic dystrophy, what they can know about their child if they have a child who has no symptoms, for example. Should they assume the child does not have myotonic dystrophy, or could the child also get adult onset myotonic dystrophy? That's a good question. So um, as, as I described, if you yourself have myotonic dystrophy, it's not 100% that your kids, each child will have myotonic dystrophy. It's 50% for each child. And for a child who is in that 50%, it's really hard to predict when they might have symptoms. Um, and we know that you know, certainly if there's something that you suspect that your child might be showing signs, which may be different from yours, it might be um, a learning disability, uh, it may be um, GI symptoms, is to go ahead and go get seen by your pediatrician or a pediatric neurologist, because that might be the early signs. For many neurological disorders that have later onset, um, we don't typically test children uh, because we don't want to put a cloud over their future. However, in myotonic dystrophy, because there are preventative medical things that you would do if your child had myotonic dystrophy, um, we do test children for myotonic dystrophy if there's a family history. But this is with genetic counseling and discussing all the pros and cons, trying to determine if your child you know, has no symptoms at all or might be showing some mild symptoms and to kind of gauge things from there because um, of, you know, the importance of an IEP in the educational environment or, you know, modifying gym class, um, monitoring the heart um, at an appropriate age. All of these things can, you know, help your child's health in the future. Uh, but it's something that um, I really recommend that you work with a genetic counselor and uh, your uh, neuromuscular specialist uh, for your child's testing um, for that. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. A similar uh, piece of the family planning question was around IVF and planning and, and pregnancy. Can you speak about that, please? Sure. So um, myotonic dystrophy is one of those disorders that can be uh, screened for with um, what's called IVF PGD, IVF in vitro fertilization PGD pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, and uh, the way that that goes about is 
well, first of all, we need to know which of the parents has myotonic dystrophy. Um, and then um, unfortunately you can't test the egg and the sperm before fertilization because you only have half of the DNA it takes to make a human in an egg or a sperm. And if you test that, there's nothing left to make a human with. So you have to wait until after fertilization in the dish. And then what they'll do is they'll take one or two cells to test and uh, they'll freeze the embryos while they're waiting for those test results. Uh, and then once the embryos are tested, then they can determine which of them carry the repeat expansion, which of them do not. And then the ones that do not have the repeat expansion, you can choose to implant uh, for, um, uh, uh, for the pregnancy. Um, if, if the mom is the individual who has the myotonic dystrophy, uh, then we recommend that you be involved with maternal fetal medicine, which those are the, you know, quote unquote, high risk OBs, um, so that you can be watched closely during your pregnancy to make sure there are no problems with the placenta, to make sure your amniotic fluid is okay, your blood pressure is doing okay, um, your breathing is doing okay, because um, pregnancy is a lot of work for your body. And if you have myotonic dystrophy and you have a tendency to have sleep apnea or have sleep apnea or weakness of your muscles, um, we need to make sure that you're staying fit and healthy uh, during your pregnancy with all this increased metabolic work your body is doing to grow this human being. Uh, and also to be ready uh, for your delivery to make sure the anesthesiologist knows about your myotonic dystrophy, what, what to use, what not to use, um, to support you during your delivery to minimize the risk of complication because even in individuals who don't have myotonic dystrophy, labor and delivery is not a zero risk uh, event. Uh, but if you have myotonic dystrophy, um, there are additional uh, risks to watch out for. And that's why we suggest delivering in a location where people are knowledgeable and prepared. Home deliveries, while you know, they sound very appealing and interesting. If you need emergency care, it just would be delayed. So I do not recommend home delivery. You can still work with a midwife or a doula in um, a hospital setting where there are those emergency uh, care uh, services uh, if needed, and you can still have that kind of environment there uh, and work with the people that you want to, uh, but you just want to have the backup plan if you need it. So it's all about prior preparation. And then if you don't need it, great. <laughs> if you do, it's there. So. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. We had a number of symptom-related questions. Uh, one was related to stomach bloating and whether there are any factors that may cause stomach bloating or other kinds of bloating um, and what, if anything, can be done to address that. That's a good question. So um, I, I'm not a gastroenterologist. I think I'm gonna refer back to some of the um, Digital Academy talks on this, um, but many individuals find that diet and fiber and hydration have a big impact on their gut motility as well as uh, probiotics. Um, uh, certainly taking antibiotics and killing off all your happy gut flora can really have a big effect but also medications can too. There are a lot of medications that can slow down gut motility, not only opiates. Um, and so watching for medications that have that property um, can be important. And then interestingly, Dr. Linda Nguyen here at Stanford has found that you know, certain medications paradoxically help uh, in myotonic dystrophy with gut motility that you wouldn't expect to, but you need to have that under the care of someone who knows how to titrate those things. Um, so I don't know if I necessarily answered your question on that. Um, you know, you should also be tested for small bowel overgrowth syndrome. Sometimes the small bowel can um, uh, develop abnormal gut flora and that can lead to problems with bloating. Um, but I would consult one of our expert myotonic dystrophy gastroenterologists on this more than me. And there, and there are an increasing number of those, so. 
Thank you, Dr. Sampson. Um, would the heart be at all related with bloating or, or water retention, fluid retention of various kinds? So or issues with the heart? That's a very good question. So abdominal bloating alone, we wouldn't expect that to be the, a heart related problem, but absolutely. If you're having swelling in your ankles, um, that is something that can be a symptom of fluid overload that can be a sign of heart failure or heart problems. It can also be a sign of if you spend a large part of your day sitting or if you're, you're you know, predominantly using a wheelchair, sometimes you can have edema just from a positional component, but you need to rule out the heart element because one of the things we know in muscular dystrophies and myotonic dystrophy is that your, your stamina, your fatigue, your muscle strength is affecting what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how much motor activity you have. And many of the symptoms of congestive heart failure are kind of activity uh, dependent. So if you're not able to exert yourself, you know, you know, forcefully because you have muscle weakness or you have lung weakness, you might not know that you have heart weakness as well because you can't do that, you know, strenuous exercise. Um, so that's why it's important to get your heart monitored. Thank you so much, Dr. Sampson. A few more on symptoms. One individual asked, why there is no sort of standard progression of body system involvement? Like why is there no, the hands are the first thing and then this happens and then this happens. Could you speak about that a little bit? That is a good question. Um, I think it, it, it just um, highlights what Peter Harper described so many years ago as Myotonic dystrophy is one of the most variable disorders that he'd encountered in his career. And um, I think a lot of it has to do with the variability between different tissues as to the repeat size. There's probably other genetic factors that affect that as well. So there might be other genes that predispose if you have myotonic dystrophy to have more rhythm problems running in one family or more diabetes running in another? I don't know. And we don't know this yet. And it is a, an important question. And I think it's one that, you know, the um, NDM1 study, you know, with their genetic studies is hoping to explore further. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Ask Dr. Day tomorrow and see if he has some better <laughs> answers for you. Um, I think there's also a questioning uh, a difference, like sometimes we ask certain questions of people and not others. So we might not really appreciate pain or fatigue if we don't ask about it. And we do know that there are some gender differences um, in certain symptoms that women tend to have more severe GI symptoms than men do. Is this a reporting bias? Is this a gender difference? I honestly don't know, um, but we do know that there are some differences there. Mm. I think your point about registries is a good one. The more folks who can get involved in a registry and include this kind of information helps to build an even more accurate picture of the disease so that physicians like you can help give, give advice on these matters. I think that's a really good point. And, and Chad Heatwell has done a lot of work on this in the past. And, you know, it's really, and the Marigold Foundation also has done a lovely a survey called the Christopher Project, um, trying to understand better from individuals themselves about how the myotonic dystrophy is affecting them. And it can be really enlightening to look at that from you, know, you as an individual's perspective to see how other people are reporting their symptoms, what were their first symptoms, what are their worst symptoms, um, how frequent are these things. Um, so it's really, um, I thought, a very illuminating um, a set of data from both those, uh, both those publications. One individual who has a child with, I wasn't sure if it was childhood onset or congenital DM, was asking about uh, overbite and tongue thrust and whether those might be related to her myotonic dystrophy. Uh, that is, a, that is a, a 
an interesting question. It probably is. And one of the things um, I know Dr. Day has, has described this well, is that as your, as your skull is developing, as you're developing as an infant, as a child, your muscles pull on your bones and affect the shape of your face. And so some of the long, thin face that we see, especially in the childhood and congenital onset, is a reflection of the uh, effect of the muscles on, on skull development. And this affects the palate. The palate is the roof of your mouth. It tends to be very high arched. It normally you know, will look kind of like this, but in someone with myotonic dystrophy, it may look more like this, which affects your dentition. And uh, it affects kind of your, your tongue function and your, your dental alignment. And so there can be a lot of dental issues and there is an effect on the tongue strength and there can be what's called tongue myotonia. So just like a hand not wanting to relax well with the myotonia, uh, the tongue can also have some stiffness with it, which can affect articulation. It can affect uh, chewing and moving the food around in your mouth but there's also weakness of the tongue itself that it just isn't as strong. And this can lead to dental problems, even dental decay. And uh, the group in Sweden has done some, uh, some publications on this that uh, you may not realize this, but your tongue is part of how you clean food off of your teeth as you eat. And your saliva has important defense mechanisms uh, in protecting your teeth from decay. And so that can uh, make a difference in dental health Plus, mm. if you have difficulty with your grip strength uh, and hand movements, brushing your teeth and those fine motor movements to get back and floss in those little areas can be really, really challenging. And so talking with your dentist about preventive dental care can be really helpful because the cardiologists are telling us that your dental health has a big effect on your heart health um, because if you don't have good dental health, it affects inflammation in your whole body. And that can affect your heart. Um, so it's it's becoming, uh, you know, an important facet, not just for your teeth, but your whole body. Um, but I did want to mention that, you know, because structurally your palate can look different in myotonic dystrophy. Um, this might um, be something that's helped with orthodontic care. Um, it's always, you know, uh, doing surgery, orthodontic surgery can be a, a big deal. In, in a child with myotonic dystrophy because of respiratory involvement, risk of aspiration, risk of you know, cognitive you know, delirium after the procedure. So it's certainly something um, you would want everybody on the team to be all in alignment on before proceeding with the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, you know, before undergoing any um, you know, you know, significant surgical uh, procedures uh, in dentistry. So, I thank you. I, I don't know if I covered that or not. Um, yes, yes, I think that was a fantastic, really thorough uh, discussion of of something that I've heard many folks discuss, and I uh, I don't think I've yet heard someone articulate um, so robustly about how those things are related and what folks can be doing about them. So, I really appreciate that response. Um, we have a few more symptom questions and just a few more minutes left here together. Uh, so briefly, could you discuss insomnia uh, as a, a symptom or something that folks with DM uh, are dealing with? That's interesting. It was something that when I started working in this field, I really didn't appreciate because we knew to ask about sleepiness and daytime fatigue and daytime sleepiness and sleep apnea, but we weren't asking about insomnia. And what we found when we did um, one of our surveys, again, this is these are things that you told us and we learned about from the, uh, the patients and families uh, is that insomnia is a real problem. Um, and uh, we found that there was a remarkably high prevalence of it on one of our sleep surveys here at Stanford. And we're still trying to figure out what the causes might be. And we think that there's probably several. And one is probably that there is a clock in our brains called a circadian rhythm um, that 
that regulates when our brains think they should be awake and when they should be asleep. And daylight has to do with it and our habits have to do with it. And if you do shift work, that can affect it as well. It's basically like jet lag. Jet lag is, you know, mm. a manifestation of your brain clock saying it's not the right time to be awake or time to be asleep. Um, and so we think part of it has to do with the circadian rhythm. Um, part of it may also be related to um, sleep habits. It mm. might be hard to get comfortable to go to sleep. It might be that um, there is a window of uh, what we call sleep pressure, where your body is ready and, and able to go to sleep easily. But if you kind of power through that with reading or watching TV or looking at a screen with a lot of blue light, um, you might, you know, kind of miss that kind of sleepiness window. And now you're in almost like this second wind awake alert period and then have trouble going to sleep because now your brain has gotten the message. Oh, it's not night yet. I shouldn't be sleeping now. Mm. Another problem is, is that because sleepiness is such a problem during the day, many people use medications to help with alertness and attention. It may, might be prescription like Adderall or um, modafinil. And of course, your doctors say, please take it at these particular times. But if you can't get up in the morning until 10 o'clock, it's hard to have taken your medication at eight. And then if you're not supposed to take your next one until six hours later, it might not be 2 p.m. It might be closer to dinner. What do you do? And one of the things that we find is that the medication might not be strong enough in your system to keep you alert, but it's also, but it's enough there to keep you from falling asleep. And this is true for caffeine and its metabolites too. So a lot of people who are not on a prescription medication for alertness, self-medicate with caffeine, a lot of caffeine and often caffeine late in the day. And so late in the day, caffeine might not make you feel alert, but it might be keeping you from falling asleep. So there's a lot of different things that can lead to trouble with sleeping, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea that you feel like, you know, you are jerking awake as your sleep apnea is setting in, not feeling comfortable, um, um, you know, muscle cramps. It's, it's complicated. And I think we're only starting to realize how much insomnia is a factor in hypersomnia and daytime fatigue. Thank you so much, Dr. Sampson. I wonder if we can ask you one more uh, community question, which is to discuss incontinence as a symptom and uh, what can be done to address incontinence. Okay, so um, there's both um, bowel and bladder incontinence can be a phenomena in myotonic dystrophy. Um, all of those muscles of the pelvic floor are muscles. Um, and uh, we know that the sphincter muscles, especially for bowel incontinence, um, can be affected in myotonic dystrophy. Um, and certainly uh, individuals who have more severe gut involvement or more severe muscle involvement overall tend to have more severe of those symptoms. Um, but this is um, an area where uh, seeing a pelvic health specialist, seeing your gastroenterologist can be helpful. We don't have any great cures or great medications for this as a problem, but it is something where symptom management and uh, timing of you know, toileting and things like that can help make things a bit more manageable. Um, and if urinary incontinence is a factor and it's, it's something that's related to pelvic floor abnormalities related to childbirth, you know, see your OBGYN, but this is not purely a problem in just women, men can be affected as well. So definitely see a urologist, talk to your gastroenterologist. And um, many uh, academic centers have pelvic health centers where they have multidisciplinary care. We have one here at Stanford uh, where they consider all of these aspects together. Thank you so much, Dr. Sampson. Do you have any closing remarks for us today? Um, I'm sure there's many more questions that I didn't have time to cover. Uh, Dr. Day is going to do his uh, uh, Ask the Expert, Stump the Experts tomorrow. 
um, I would encourage you to uh, tune in to the industry updates. I'm not sure which group is presenting when, but if you have questions about what's exciting and current in the field, that is the best place to uh, get the latest. Uh, it's what I'm going to be doing. Um, and then I look forward to seeing you all in uh, some of the social hours and events. Well, everyone, you just heard from the great Jacinda Sampson uh, of Stanford. We have all learned so much together. I'm sure we're all very grateful to her. Feel free to send her a message in the conference platform uh, to thank her for the session. If you have some more questions, I'm sure she'll be uh, willing to get to them if she's able to. And otherwise, we will see you around the conference. Thank you all so much for attending the session.